sides to refrain from violence, <laughs> you know, even though the regime was being far more violent. Um, and there's, there's no, and, and gradually there is, um, you know, more calls for democratic change. But, but, but um, Obama's strongest, most eloquent words in support of the pro-democracy uh, struggle literally happened on the day or the day after the, uh, the dictators fled. Um, it was, uh, and, and it, it was much more about not wanting to be on the wrong side of history than, than being any kind of catalyst uh, for, for change. And I think this illustrates that despite the long-standing sense of fatalism that, we've, that you see in the Arab world, uh, among Arabs, that, that Washington will ultimately impact what happens on the Arab street, that the Arab street has proven itself capable of impacting what happens in Washington. Uh, and and the, um, the, 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 the sense, not just uh, you know, bias among academia, academics that, I, that I've, I've uh, referred to, to, to earlier, but even among many of the people themselves, uh, of, of essentially being victims of history, I think has been really, uh, really um, transformed uh, by what we've seen in recent months. And the, um, um, Obama, unfortunately, in rejecting the dangerous neoconservatism uh, of his predecessor, I think, you know, has largely fallen back on the realpolitik of previous administrations. Um, and yeah, I've always, I always found it ironic the U.S. position, you know, is that that we um, uh, end up uh, backing up these regimes that brutally suppress incipient pro-democracy struggles, and then turn around and say, oh. They don't want democracy because it's not in their culture. And then we arm Israel on the grounds that it's the sole democracy of the Middle East. Um, the, uh, but, but, but to give Obama credit, there was some subtle, but I think some important um, shift in the US government's discourse uh, on, on human rights. Um, you know, Bush pushes rather superficial um, structuralist view you know, that basically if you have elections, you know, therefore you're democratic. And he actually praised the uh, presidential election, last presidential election in, in, in Egypt, because Mubarak allo allowed an oppos opposition candidates to, to run. Though, you know, of course, he um, ended up getting, what, 80% of the vote, supposedly, and, uh, and, and threw the opposition, leading opposition candidate in jail, and <laughs> et cetera. And, um, I mean, and he, he you know, praised Sana, uh, the, the praised um, uh, uh, <clears throat> the Yemeni, uh, the Yemeni election. <laughs> And, uh, and even the, the Saudi uh, Municipal Advisory Council elections is a great sign of how democracy is spreading in the Middle East. I mean, they, I mean these elections made the, the um, Iranian elections look democratic by comparison. But uh, um, Obama hasn't really, really fallen for that. I think he does take something more of an agency view of, um, uh, uh, of democracy, and I think it's important that he really emphasized, that even though he didn't, did not come down nearly as strong as I'd, as I'd hoped, um, at least he really emphasized the idea of allowing people to protest, uh, um, allowing the internet to, 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 to uh, go online again, to really, um, because I think he, he does recognize, perhaps because of his history as a community organizer or something, uh, but that, that you know, change you know, really can uh, come from below, and that's, that's what, what that, you know, and, and that, Get, get, uh, providing that civic space, in other words, and that uh, then the people uh, can uh, end up um, deciding, can really end up uh, making, making a difference. And I think this, again, this underscores ultimately where power comes from, that even if a government has a monopoly of military force, even if the government has the support of the world's one remaining superpower, it's ultimately powerless if people refuse to recognize its authority through general strikes, through uh, filling the streets, uh, mass refusal to obey official orders, and other forms of nonviolent resistance, even the most autocratic regime uh, cannot survive. Um, the, but we, um, and I think one cannot help but admire, you know, the Egyptians who, who like the Tunisians, Serbians, Filipinos, Poles, and, and, and many others um, have uh, put their lives in the line um, for, for basic freedoms. But uh, I think as long as the United States remains the world's number one supplier of security assistance to repressive governments um, in the Middle East and elsewhere, uh, I think one can make the case the need for a massive nonviolent action in support of freedom and democracy in the Middle East may be no greater than here. 
Now, in addition to you know, backing Middle Eastern regimes with security assistance and other aid, some U.S. embassy staffers you know, did have uh, and, ha and, and do have uh, sporadic contacts with pro-democracy activists in Arab countries. And some congressionally funded foundations, such as the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, you know, have um, even provided some you know, limited uh, um, financial support for certain um, um, uh, uh, projects uh, in terms of, you know, so, of uh, for various civil society organizations, uh, particularly in Egypt. But the small amount of democracy assistance um, traditionally has gone to elite opposition groups, not the more radical grassroots um, organizations that led the resistance to the U.S. Uh, 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 backed uh, uh, dictatorships. Uh, the, um, in fact, a number of them refused USA on principle. Um, and, and none of this aid or assistance or, or workshops or whatever involved um, uh, training in strategic nonviolent action or other forms of grassroots mobilization that, that, that proved so decisive. In any case, you know, the amount of money through NED and whatever paled in comparison to the um, billions of dollars of aid, $70 billion in aid to, to, to Mubarak, for example, in the past 30 years. Um, and, and the close and regular cooperation between U.S. Uh, political and military officials and the Egyptian government. In fact, uh, Obama largely cut off the uh, support for these democracy assistance programs uh, soon after he came to office. So um, again, I want to emphasize that the uh, U.S. Uh, does not deserve the credit or the blame, depending on one's perspective, uh, for, for what uh, tran transpired. Um, in fact, just a little footnote, I mentioned Kafaya earlier. Uh, they boycotted, uh, they, uh, to Obama's credit, he invited some uh, opposition representatives to his uh, speech in the University of Cairo, but Kafaya refused. They turned down the invitation saying, we want, uh, we want action, not, not just words. Um, now, I also want to emphasize, I want to talk a little bit about, about the, the role of the internet. There's been a lot of um, talk about the role of Facebook in particular. And uh, certainly social media helped expose the abuses of the regime and uh, helped, helped get around the censorship. And during the revolt, it helped with tactical coordination of protests. But I think it, it's a mistake to overemphasize it, I think, as some people have. For one thing, less than 15% of the Egyptian population has access to internet. And most of that is through internet cafes that are heavily policed. Um, and during that critical five-day period early in the uprising when there was no internet, that's when the um, movement grew the most, most dramatically. In fact, uh, in, in certain ways, the, the shutdown helped the movement, uh, both because a, a lot of people were upset that they uh, lost their internet service, but also um, people wanting to know what was going on in the streets couldn't find out the internet, so they went out to check it out themselves and got swept up in the protest. And parents worried about their kids couldn't get, get through to them on, and, and to cell phones, whatever. So they came out and, and joined and, and may have actually uh, helped uh, uh, lead to, to, uh, to greater, greater numbers. And so on balance, while the internet was, was, was helpful, um, it, 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 it was, I don't think it was necessary. I mean, when you think of all these, um, the Eastern, uh, Eastern European revolutions, 89, that was before there was internet, and similarly in many, most of the Latin American, Southeast Asian, African uh, countries. Uh, Mali, which uh, had a, a successful nonviolent struggle against the Triari regime in 1991, word of their movement spread uh, using griots, you know, the traditional sing-songy storytellers going from village to village. Um, you know, so so my, my point here is that if, um, if, if people are committed to a struggle, they're going to find a way to communicate one way or the other. And yeah, yeah, the internet is a very useful tool, but again, I don't want to fall into this idea, oh, Western technology comes and saves the day or whatever, that this is, uh, again, uh, you know, not to, to let's just, that, let's, um, um, I think one way or the other, uh, the uh, people of Egypt, Tunisia, and, and these other struggles would find other ways to, to get their word out. Uh, and and I, similarly, the WikiLeaks thing. Um, I mean, yes, leaked cables exposed how U.S. diplomats were aware of the corruption and repression of these respective regimes and, and the propensity of these regimes to exaggerate the influence of radical Islamists among the opposition. Uh, but this was nothing new. Uh, this is nothing new.